Hello, my name is John David Powell, the Interim Director of Communication for the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences at the University of Houston. The election of Barack Obama as the nation's 44th president is the topic of our discussion this month with three researchers. Tyrone Tillery is an associate professor in the Department of History specializing in African American and Civil Rights History. He served as the executive director of the Detroit branch of the NAACP and is recipient of the 1993 Gustavus Myers Center Outstanding Book Award on the subject of intolerance in the United States. And his latest book is The Role of Government in Race Relations in Detroit, Michigan, 1943 to 1968. Geronimo Cortina is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, a research associate at the Center for Public Policy, and a visiting scholar in the Center for Mexican American Studies. And he's one of the authors of Red State, Blue State, Rich State, Poor State, Why Americans Vote the Way They Do. And Jim Granado is the director of the Center for Public Policy and an associate professor in the Department of Political Science. His recent book is The Role of Policymakers in Business Cycle Fluctuations, and it's a pleasure to have all three of you with us today. Let's start with you. Why did Americans vote the way they voted? This um, was an interesting election when you take a, a look at uh, just how they voted and, and why. So why, how did this happen? Well, I mean, I think there were a lot of uh, issues in the election, this particular election. Obviously, the economy played a very important role. Uh, the economic situation was something that was that went into people's into the mass public's pockets. Mm -hmm. So they felt the economic uh, uh, downturns of, of, of these past months. Um, in our book, what we uh, suggested a, a couple of months ago was that we found a paradox. Right? And this paradox was at the individual level, but also at the state level. So at the state level, we see that rich states tended to vote for the Democratic candidate in past elections. The red states being California, New York. The coast, uh, basically, Florida. right? Florida, uh, 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 well, not, not, not Florida per se, but just the coast, uh, New York, California, uh, Connecticut, okay. uh, uh, the Northeast and the, and the West. But at the individual level, you see a different, a different pattern. And that pattern was that rich voters are more likely to vote for the Republican candidate than poor voters. So we see, and if you compare those things, they go in opposite directions. So our question is, how can we explain these uh, uh, patterns? How can we reconcile these patterns? And what we found was that income, individual level income, is a stronger predictor of your vote choice if you live in a poor state than if you live in a rich state. So in other words, if you live in Connecticut, your income is not going to be a very important predictor on how you vote, right? Okay. However, if you live in Mississippi, the poorer state in the nation, income is going to be a significant predictor on how you vote. And that is that the richer you are, the more likely you are to vote for the Republican candidate. Okay. So the next question was, obviously, why you see that in Mississippi and not in Connecticut? And that's where, you know, we, we, we came up with uh, different explanations. One explanation is the, the state culture, right? Uh, different, co different states have different cultures, uh, <clears throat> different patterns in, in terms of uh, local uh, political cultures that affect them, conservatism, uh, religiousness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in other parts of the country, such as Connecticut, the richest state in, in the country, the society there, people there tend to be more liberal, tend to be more progressive, et cetera, et cetera. So those are uh, the main finds that we found in our book. In this election, the data that we have so far suggests that those patterns still hold, even though that the Democrats won uh, 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 more states than in, in 2004, those patterns on average still are holding. Okay, does this hold with what you have seen over the years? Well, yes, uh, I think clearly when it comes to race and, and uh, uh, economic and educational factors uh, and regional factors in terms of culture, uh, historically, southern states have basically been extremely conservative. Uh, before the uh, administration of uh, FDR, uh, uh, Roosevelt, uh, the Democratic Party was basically ruled by Southern mm -hmm. Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was extraordinarily conservative, particularly on the issue of race. 
Now, that party changes during the 1970s, and some will argue even earlier, that the Republican Party actually becomes the heir apparent to the old right wing of the Democratic Party uh, because of affirmative action, or call, because of civil rights, because of, of gender and racial equality. Uh, the many of the Democrats within uh, the party moved over to the Republican Party, and thus it becomes the base today of the uh, the Republican Party. Uh, so, uh, but in terms of basically, you, you still in terms of race, in terms of e an income and education, uh, I think it, it holds true. If you looked in the uh, the exit polls found something interesting. In California, for instance, the, uh, the state went for Obama, yet the, uh, the state also approved the anti-gay measure, the anti-gay uh, marriage measure. In Harris County, the voters went for Obama, yet they also went for Cornyn. Uh, why? Was, was, why would you see this, that, that you had people voting for the Democrat for Obama, yet on other issues, they went more conservative down the ballot. Well, I don't think people realize still how uh, how conflicted Americans are uh, over the question of of uh, uh, of homosexuality and and gay rights. Uh, for instance, if you look at the African American population, uh, it tends to be far more homophobic than other parts of the uh, uh, the population, along I think with Hispanics, uh, they tend to be more homophobic. That again may be a function of education and a function of, of, of class. So it, it to me it was not surprising that they could vote for uh, Barack Obama and not necessarily vote for uh, a gay rights as they didn't do in many of the states out west. Get to your area, which is public policy. Now we have a uh, Congress that's controlled by the Democrats and a White House that's controlled by the Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, we, when we were talking last month, uh, before the election, on uh, some ideas you had about how what, what you thought uh, would be the way things would go, what do you think now? Well, since he's going to be a majority president, majority presidents have the most influence, of course, because they got the most political capital. Mm -hmm. Is the the most like-minded people to help get legislation through. And since Article One is where the action is in terms of getting things done, not Article Two where the president's power is derived. And there's there's very little domestic power given to the president, formal domestic power. It's in the foreign sphere. So Barack Obama now has a majority in both houses. He almost has a filibuster proof majority in the Senate. It's, we don't know yet, but it's possible he can pick off Susan Collins and, and um, Olympia Snow and Maine, who are moderate, Repu moderate to liberal Republicans, to build this coalition um, to provide for a filibuster-approved Senate, which means he will have free reign to get many things done that he wants. Um, now, right now, the immediate issue, though, is, is the economy. So health care, energy, all these big issues where you have to build a coalition, those will be done, but the immediate thing for him to do right now is get a stimulus package through Congress. He has to do that first. Okay. Is there any comparison to Johnson's term, uh, his, his own, say, six, in 64, uh, where you had the passage of the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 64, I believe, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 65, and you had all of these social programs that they pushed through during the first uh, year or so of, of his presidency. The Democrats, I believe, controlled both houses at the time in the White House. But things didn't work out as, as he thought they would after about three years. Well, yes, you know, he in inherited a war, he inherited uh, social problems. And, and I'm, are there any parallels here? Well, I think f first we ought to point out that this election was, in many ways, an anomaly. Uh, an anomaly, I think, brought upon by the eight years of the Bush administration. I do believe that by 2008, Americans were on the verge of some sort of emotional breakdown. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, with the things that had, had the war, uh, the assault on American civil and, 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 and uh, uh, 
civil rights. Uh, I think that Amer then the economy and, and the war in Iraq, which, which went against American uh, historical tradition of, of unilateralism. I, I think it was so many things that I think Americans had gotten to the point that they had just had enough. And I think it became, it allowed the opportunity for a number of people uh, mm -hmm. to run for office who I think, had it not been for George's Bush administration, would not have the would not have had the opportunities. For instance, if we had not had such eight years of such a disastrous presidency and Republican-led Congress, that we would have had the opportunity for Barack Obama or uh, a woman uh, uh, to take center stage in, in, in terms of the presidency. While I think we had moved, we have moved far. Uh, I think that had not these unusual circumstances all coming together at the same time uh, allowed Americans to look past certain cultural and certain ideological uh, uh, points of view that I don't think that before they would have been able to. Is there a certain level of managing expectations that uh, Obama now faces, do you think? I think there are a lot of expectations uh, that he faces, but you know, again, I want to you know, sort of repeat what John Lewis said, the former civil rights uh, leader and, and, and the congressman from Georgia, is that Barack Obama was elected to be president of the United States, not of African Americans, not of Hispanic Americans, or all the other groups that, that uh, accounted for his victory. But at the same time, obviously, I think that would be great pressures to, and I think justifiably so, to reward many of those people who came together to create such, to create this wonderful, you know, change in, uh, in our government. And, you know, I, I really, the more I studied Barack Obama, because I think that as an African American, we went through the same process uh, of know, uh, getting to know him as many other Americans did. Uh, he was not traditionally out of our experience. He was not African American. He did not come out of the civil rights uh, uh, tradition. Uh, we, my father, my grandfather were all participants, both in the civil rights movement and, and also in the fight against uh, inequality and, and, and often racial inequality in this country. So in many ways, Barack Obama was very different being Kenyan and, and, and being half, and, and being white, uh, and not spending a great deal of his time in America until his adult years. We had, like, like everyone else, we came to understand and know this man, and particularly I think what, what, was, what was important for me was Michelle Obama. Michelle Obama, in many ways, for me at least, legitimized Obama as an African American because of her experience, which is clearly within the pale of my experience. And, I, and when I saw her and heard her and watched them together, I said, wow, what a, what a duo. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a wonderful. And then the more you, and the more you listened to him, you discovered how extraordinarily bright and intelligent this man. And the one thing that I think that uh, it, even Republicans like uh, David Brooks pointed out, that the Republican Party had a dearth of intellectual rigor and, and ideas as, as to where this country was going to go. And yet, if you look at Obama and the people that he's surrounded with, these are some extraordinarily smart people. They are forward looking, and I think they, they have a lot of great ideas that will get us through a very difficult period. Let me ask you about the parties. What does each party need to take away from this election to succeed four years from now or two years from now? Well, I guess, I mean, uh, as Jim was uh, suggesting, I mean, the Democrats have to seize the day and take advantage of their majority. If they don't do what they can do in these two years, then they're going to be uh, held accountable. Right? And, and the problem is uh, the expectations that were raised during the campaign. And uh, obviously, uh, the president-elect since yesterday, or oh, since uh, Friday was his first uh, um, uh, press conference as a, as a president-elect, has already started 
to manage those expectations, saying the road ahead is very complicated, it's going to take time. So I'm sure that in every single message, he's going to put those words somewhere or another. That's one thing. And the Democrats have to seize the day in order to implement as much policy as they want mm -hmm. uh, 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 in terms of trying to deliver their promises. Uh, and obviously on the topics that uh, Jim Boyd suggested, the, the economy, energy, et cetera, et cetera. Republicans, on the other hand, have to go back and think where do they want to go? Do they want to be the Rush Limbaugh kind of party, right? Or, you know, the old Republican party, you know, towards business, uh, uh, kind of the 1950s uh, sort of, of, sort of a, a political ideology. They have to reinvent themselves as they did in 94 with uh, uh, Newt Greenwich. They have to st uh, stop, think, and say, what's the new reaction? And who's going to take us there? Is it going to be Governor Palin? Well, I think that the Democrats are going to be very happy with that. Are there going to be another you know, leader within the Republican Party? Well, we have to see uh, who's that. But uh, it's a period for introspection, for really seeing what went wrong and how they're going to, you know, uh, dig themselves out of their hole. They're almost like a product without a brand right now. Exactly. Yeah. But I want to point out that I think for the Democrats, we, we have an opportunity that was not there during the Great Depression. In, in many ways, what has happened to our economy in the last eight years was very similar to what happened uh, under, under the Republicans during the 1920s, an era of... De uh, complete deregulation, the idea of what was good for big business, what was good for America, what was good for America, what was good for big business, and, there was, and, and they were not symbiotic. Uh, second, there was a great uh, uh, maldistribution of wealth in the country, and uh, then there was the, the irresponsible banking practices. I mean, it, it, it was once said that in the 1920s, and the banks uh, provided everything but a roulette will. Now, and, and the, the one of the real problems that, about the Great Depression in 19, uh, 1929 was that you had a garden-style recession combined with the end of a period of long-term capital investment in the automobile industry, which left us with nothing to go, uh, no basic uh, industry to build on. We have that opportunity now. That opportunity is we, while we have a recession, we also have a period now to begin a period of long-term capital in, in investment in a major industry, and that is in the uh, uh, the green industry, in in, uh, in the industry industry uh, uh, in, uh, energy industry, to build this whole infrastructure, and with it, all kinds of allied uh, positions and jobs and sectors. Yeah, I think the parallel of the Great Depression is a good a good point. Um, the key thing to remember about the Great Depression though, is there's an academic consensus that the major cause of the Great Depression was the failure of the Federal Reserve to act. It allowed over a two-year period the quantity of money decline by over a third. And since the quantity of money is tied to GDP, GDP collapsed. So it was the Federal Reserve's failure to act and, and provide sufficient credit that led to the Great Depression. Now, what's happening right now is the Fed knows those lessons. The chairman of the Fed, Ben Bernanke, is, an, is a scholar who studies the Great Depression. So he's doing the things needed to provide sufficient credit to make sure we don't have that type of collapse. And one of the very most radical things he's done is he's having the Fed purchase commercial paper and that's that is unbacked um, debt that, that corporations that issue because right now a lot of banks aren't even lending to each other so in order to unclog that 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 the um, the the, um, the barrier to lending and lending businesses that are good risk to continue to operations the Federal Reserve is stepping in to lend to these businesses that are good risk so that's on that side the Fed is doing the right thing um, I would disagree a little bit here okay. in, in that the Federal Reserve in the 1920s certainly was not the Federal Reserve today. Uh, and in, in terms of the power and, uh, 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 that it had to regulate the economy. In fact, in the 1920s, the banks had very little control over large industries because of the enormous amount of wealth that they made. If you look at Luchtenberg's book and, and a number of other uh, 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 economic historians, they argued that they became so wealthy that they didn't have to really abide by the rules of the Federal Reserve because they had so much money. They didn't have to even borrow from uh, 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 the 
the Federal Reserve. It's a, that's a little different. Uh, the major problem, I think, again, of, of the Federal is, of, of the economy then was uh, what I mentioned about these two uh, trends colliding, which, which presented, which created a perfect storm. But secondly, under consumption, there was not the, 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 for years. People said that the great the problem of the Great Depression was overproduction, and they tried to, to to solve it by by getting by by cutting back on things and by taking things out of circulation. When it was really under consumption, again, the money was not that, that was a maldistribution of wealth. We know in our uh, in our country that sixty two percent or two thirds of our economy is generated by Americans in their ability to, uh, to uh, as consumers. Uh, and when, we, when they don't have money, we have a contraction in the economy and we begin to have uh, a recession. We see the same things that are happening now, except it's a lot more complex. We have a global economy. We have such a sophisticated economy that what, what, what amazed me but didn't surprise me is that all these national, all these well-known economists, including uh, 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 Greenspan, suddenly told us they didn't know what had happened, you know. Uh, and the truth is, the economy is so sophisticated and is so interrelated to the global economy. Even though it was related to the global economy in the 1920s, it was not nearly as as inter uh, integrated as it is now. And I think one of the things we're going to have to do is try to understand our economy. Um, I think the Federal Reserve's role since 1913 has been lender of last resort. They, they did not, and I'm going to disagree with you on this, um, <laughs> they did not provide sufficient credit. <laughs> Second, and this is very important, the New Deal is perceived publicly, and, and we, we were taught in high school that it was a great success. That's the symbolism. Now, if we want to manage expectations, the effect of the New Deal was they have unemployment at the end of his eight, first eight years in office for Franklin Roosevelt. Unemployment was higher than when he took office. And the reason why is the New Deal restricted entry in various industries. It protected, it created cartels. It suppressed price changes. Um, there were many rules that restricted private enterprise from trying to expand. And so in many respects, while the symbolism of doing something um, was out there, the actual effect was counterproductive and actually slowed down any type of economic recovery. Well, here again, it, I think Jump certainly, in here anytime. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think certainly the New Deal did not solve the Great Depression. Well, we all know that uh, by 1938, the economy had relapsed. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and the works part of the economy, it, it, it certainly helped as, as a temporary stopgap measure, but it didn't, it, it didn't solve the Depression. The only thing that solved the Depression was, was World War II, you know, which, which, which stimulated the economy. So... You know, I don't know. You know, uh, uh, which the we're Federal not looking forward to to have, a, have another one. Today. But if you look at the Federal Reserve in 1913, when, you know, uh, uh, and, and look at it now, I, I think it's it's a uh, while they established the essential framework, the, you know, the uh, the Federal Reserve system with the Federal Reserve Board and, and the 12 banks, uh, Federal Reserve uh, banks. I don't. I'm not sure they function quite the way uh, that the Federal Reserve does today. Um, there were several changes in 1935, and, and the biggest one was the Accord of 1951. But the, the, the legislation created the Federal Reserve provided the Federal Reserve with power to be lender of last resort and conduct open market operations. So prior to 1930, the Federal Reserve did conduct counter-cyclical policy every once in a while, and Benjamin Strong was a very strong advocate. Now, it's true that they've expanded their tools and their reach since the Depression. It's, again, 1951 is the key. The Accord of 51 is key because that's when the Federal Reserve was completely separated from the Treasury Department, and that's another discussion for later. But the point is the Federal Reserve did have the tools, and Alan Meltzer and other scholars have studied this show conclusively that the, you can see the actual quantity of money declining. And so as you know, there's a very strong relationship between the money supply and GDP, that is growth, Mm -hmm. They're very much tight. When one goes down by a third, which the Fed has control over, GDP is going to fall, and that's what devastated the United States economy. This is one of those wonderful <laughs> 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 when, when we just talk forever, but, but we can't. We're going to have to call, this, uh, call a halt to this, but this is, this is great. Uh, Tyrone Tillery, uh, Jim Granado, and Geronimo Cortina, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for being with us. I'm John David Powell, and we'll see you next month.